a good afternoon from World Travel Market in London. And on behalf of the World Tourism Forum Lucerne, with whom we're co-hosting this discussion this afternoon on biodiversity and tourism, we'd like to thank our audience also for joining us this afternoon. We're discussing the redesign and reset of the travel and tourism industry uh, in a post-COVID world, but also as part of a great reset of our relationship between people and nature and this industry that we all love and admire. And we do that in the context of three overarching challenges. Climate change, ensuring carbon neutrality by 2050, biodiversity loss, ensuring no more species loss after 2030, and then decisively addressing poverty and inequality in society. And when we look at the relationship between biodiversity and tourism in this overall context, we have to recognize that there's some positives, many positives on the nature balance sheet of tourism, but unfortunately also some negatives. And unfortunately, parts of our industry have been on an unsustainable growth path even before COVID hit due to some construction structural factors in the, in the travel and tourism industry. And we're here today to talk about some of those positives and some of those negatives on tourism's balance sheet for nature. And I'm privileged to be joined by, by five panelists. I know them all very well. Uh, five panelists is passionate about the industry, but passionate about our planet and its people. Uh, and I'm gonna go uh, from the top right, Aradna Kuala, Aradna CEO of APTA Mind, and chairperson of the advisory board of a Red Sea project in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Ariala Kahuruka is uh, with the Rwanda Tourism Development Board and a long time advocate and, and, and achieving many successes uh, in looking after endangered species and, and the mountain gorilla project. John Scanlon, uh, former Secretary General of CITES and CEO of, uh, well, recently changed, John, the CEO of the Elephant Protection Initiative and also chairperson of a global initiative to end wildlife crime. Shannon Gion. Shannon is a chief sustainability officer of the Trade Right Foundation and the Travel Corporation, which represents 40 brands in 70 countries. They touch the lives of roughly 2 million travelers every year. And then finally, Justin Francis. Justin, the CEO of, of the UK Responsible Travel. So thank you very much for joining us uh, for this panel this afternoon and, and, uh, and for making your time available to share some of your insights at WTM London. I'm gonna start, uh, jump right into it and start with science and the urgency of taking action. We heard last year in the IPBS report, the groundbreaking report, that biodiversity is declining faster than at any point in human history. And that about 1 million animal and plant species face extinction, many of them within a few decades. So I want to start with you, John, uh, and your background. Is, is how urgent is this problem and, and why should we care? Thanks, Sean. Thanks to the organisers. Thanks to you for your passion and always bringing us together to discuss these issues. Uh, the reality is that the outlook for biodiversity is pretty grim. Uh, you referred to the UN IPBS report that came out last year. It says we're, you know, looking at a million of eight million species going extinct over coming decades. Uh, we've lost, we've only got 23% of the oceans and 23% of the land that are regarded as intact ecosystems. We've lost 85% of our wetlands by area. The WWF Living Planet Report says over the last 50 years, we've lost over two thirds of our wild animals. That's where we're sitting today. Um, and the prognosis is pretty poor. Now, why should we care about it? Well, from a tourism industry, if you're in wildlife-based tourism or eco-based tourism, you're losing the asset that underpins that industry. So if you lose the biodiversity, you lose the asset, you, you lose everything that goes with it. But from a broader perspective, Biodiversity is the, the fundamental foundation of life. Biodiversity gives us clean air, clean water, clean soils. It's about food production. And you mentioned climate change. It's about combating climate change, the ability to sequester carbon, build resilience. So if we lose biodiversity, basically it's game over for all of us, not just the tourism industry, it's game over completely. Now what the IPBS report did tell us, which is important, 
is that it's not too late. We still have time to change course. And if we change course, we can reverse these trends. But I must say that hasn't been the history to date. Uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity set targets for 2010. We didn't meet them. Set targets for 2020. We're not going to meet them. It's going to set new targets next year in Kunming and China out to 2030. We're going to have to start to turn around these trends because if we don't, it's not only going to be tragic for the tourism industry, but tragic for society overall. But we can do it. And the tourism industry is going to be a key player in helping us do it. Well, I want to jump straight from that to, to Justin, because Justin, I know you're on record saying 2050 is too late. The travel and tourism industry can actually be nature positive much earlier. And, and you, there's some green shoots out there. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I mean, let's, let, let's say that a tiny part of the tourism industry, the global tourism industry, has been extremely active in conservation for decades. Um, at Responsible Travel, we have about 1,500 wildlife holidays, very carefully screened. The biggest issues have been habitat loss. Um, and that's really, that and anti-poaching is where historically the tourism industry has focused. But let's take the wider picture. Um, the current level of land under protection is insufficient. It's insufficient either to protect biodiversity or to help us sufficiently with nature-based carbon sequestration. I think we need to get to closer to 50% of our total land mass under protection. And nature and wildlife, wildlife tourism can play, as John said, a key part in that if it can grow from its tiny niche. Let's be honest, it's expensive. It's largely for rich white people. Um, if we can grow our industry responsibly, we can make a better case for protecting more land for nature. And just finally, tourism is powerful, but it can't do this on its own. We need to change what we eat because what we eat often results in conversion of wildlife rich land into farmland, intensive agriculture. We need to reduce our food waste. There are seven key commodities we need to stop consuming because they destroy wildlife all over the world. We need to look at diversifying conservation away from just tourism so it's more resilient, things like biodiversity credits and of course government support. But in short, if we can grow nature-based tourism responsibly, alongside those other measures that I've identified, we can make the case for protecting more land for nature and biodiversity, for the benefit of wildlife, for the benefit of our fight against the climate crisis, and for the benefit of, of human life on, on the planet. And in the process, create green jobs, uh, which I know are right now is something that you're very passionate about, uh, when you talk about regenerative tourism. Yes, I was, uh, Sean, if you don't mind, can I just get very combative at the outset and get a good debate going? Uh, and I agree with Joan and Justin both, but I want to go to the point that you raised about why should people care? Because the fact is people only care when something affects them personally, right? And I know it sounds terrible, but as bad as it sounds, COVID has in some form or the other impacted every single person. And I personally think we will never get a better poster child to highlight how COVID, climate change and biodiversity loss is all interlinked. I mean, for starters, we forget that coronavirus originated from nature. We should care and we should care more because the destruction of ecosystems is often the very starting point and one of the key reasons why all kinds of diseases spread. I mean, the data is stark, right? A 4% deforestation in the Amazon rainforest, 50% increase in malaria. So this is not about doing the right thing anymore. I don't want to, I'm sorry, I don't want to cause eco-anxiety, uh, but quite frankly, unless we find a way to regenerate, unless we find a way to enhance biodiversity and do it quickly, like Justin said, we are fatally doomed. Now let's, let's talk about two success stories and we'll focus, we'll take a deeper dive on, on some of the negatives on the balance sheet as well. But Ariella, I, I know you have an amazing success story of a mountain gorillas and you just at the 16, uh, gorilla, 16 gorilla naming ceremony to also celebrate the achievements in Rwanda, uh, removing or moving the, the mountain gorillas from the IUCN red, red species list from critically endangered to endangered. How did you change the, the social compact and the model in, in Rwanda to achieve this? 
Thank you, Sean. I'm really happy to join this uh, conversation today. Um, I think the, the success of uh, mountain gorillas conservation definitely go goes beyond Rwanda, as we know it, uh, because uh, these uh, majestic animals do range in also uh, two of our neighboring countries. Um, and uh, this definitely has called for transboundary collaboration uh, that goes beyond the efforts, the individual efforts of the different countries. And this is something that is uh, very important in uh, today's um, uh, conservation because uh, without uh, you know, collaborative efforts, uh, I think we can only achieve uh, uh, perhaps nothing because you know, uh, we can all work towards one goal. And uh, with this, uh, uh, in the mountain gorilla um, landscape, we've we were able to establish a joint mechanism uh, through the Greta Virunga transboundary collaboration, the GVTC. And therefore the success highlighted by shifting uh, from critically endangered to endangered uh, on the IUCN red list, uh, you know, comes from those uh, efforts that are shared across the landscape. In particular in Rwanda, uh, we've put really uh, a lot of effort and energy in the mountain gorilla conservation. And uh, therefore, uh, in general, uh, our tourism activities def also uh, depend on not only gorillas, but also on eco-based uh, tourism uh, assets. And uh, it is uh, very important to note that uh, the constant increase of uh, the mountain gorillas that we've seen for the last two decades is definitely a worth a celebration, but uh, it also puts us on um, a different challenge, which is how do we sustainably preserve their habitat uh, to uh, ensure a viable habitat for them because they're increasing, but their habitat is not increasing at the same rate. And therefore, I would say that uh, one of the initiatives that the government of Rwanda is putting in place is to ensure that the gorilla habitat, uh, which is the Go uh, Volcanoes National Park, uh, is increased uh, by 23% uh, through a, 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 a seven year program that will see not only uh, gorilla habitat increased, but also the local communities' uh, lives also uh, improve further than they are today. That's a true public, private and community partnership and you need industry to play a, a central role in that. So let me turn to industry, Shannon. Um, the Travel Corporation, two million travelers a year. I'm aware, going to the point that Justin raised that the urgency of action, you know, we can't wait for 2030, is that you used the circuit break uh, due to COVID-19 to, to take a step back as a company. And to also respond to what Aratna said, is, is using this opportunity to rethink and redesign your sustainability strategy for the next five years. Uh, so maybe you can start by telling us what you'll be doing differently, concretely, in the next five years. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, you're right. We just we just launched our new five year sustainability strategy, how we tread right. So it's it brings us up to 2025 with 11 smart goals. Um, I think what's important is that we started this process in, in uh, back at the latter half of last year, but COVID, um, you know, much to, I guess, the point that everybody's made on this, it, there's a clear link between, at our organization, and the way we see assets, I, I always feel like that's a crude word for travel and tourism, but it is, it is useful, assets, um, and our business's resiliency, and our industry's resiliency, and resiliency full stop, so... Um, this new strategy is uh, based on our ability to measure. So whilst we built our uh, 11 goals, SMART goals, as I said, each one of them are measurable. Likewise, we built a reporting structure to ensure that nothing went without um, our ability to commit to it, measure it, report on it. Our first impact report will come out um, at the close or at the start of 22. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, to address the world's issues, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, we are a global company, we can't touch everything, but we have tried. So it is an aggressive strategy. We have goals that address um, climate change. So we've committed to being carbon neutral by 2030. We are tracking for that to be much, much sooner um, and likely will land between 2025 and, and um, 2027. Um, our goal is to exceed that goal. 
COVID made us push it out, push it out to 2030, of course, just to be uh, realistic. We're addressing food waste, um, reducing our organization's food waste by 50%. We're increasing um, sustainable agriculture as it's integrated into all of our experiences um, across the goal. We're just finalizing that baseline now. Um, you know, and I just want to say one point. I've worked in in this business since I was since I was 16. And there's always that conversation about, um, you know, and it's, it's a point you made earlier, Justin, the, the conversation about it has to be sort of niche, uh, small uh, in order to be sustainable. Well, I feel like that omits a, a, a massive part of the industry that's not going anywhere. Um, and I feel wholeheartedly that that needs to shift that conversation because if those of us that operate at scale don't get on board, everything we do in the niche space, unfortunately, is rendered moot. So I just, I feel very strongly that, that those of us that are the bigger players um, need to toe the line on this. So I want to take a bit of a deeper dive in, in the COVID slowdown in travel and tourism. We know the conservation estate depends heavily on tourism revenues. In a country like South Africa, where I come from, we've got 90 national parks, 40,000 square kilometers. That's roughly the size of, of the whole of Switzerland. But they only get 20% of their conservation budget from government. And the other 80% comes from the private sector and tourism. So this is a question, I think, going to Justin, John, Ariella, the, the impact on the conservation estate in Africa and, and the whole partnership model. Um, are we going to see increased poaching? Are we going to see increased pressure on habitats? Are we going to see communities without safety nets reverting to unsustainable livelihoods because there's no alternative? And how are governments responding? Maybe we can start with, with you, Ariella. Uh, thanks, Sean. I think, um, as I said um, earlier, collaboration is key. And uh, in Rwanda, I guess, uh, um, beyond what, I, what talk, I talked about earlier with regards to uh, transboundary collaboration. In Rwanda, we've also established, uh, you know, a strong partnership with our communities. The communities living adjacent the national parks are the co-investors co in, you know, the preservation of these national assets. And, um, you know, this we've been able to do it through, you know, a constant sensitization, but also through a tourism revenue sharing scheme that we've implemented for decades. And uh, we've seen that uh, with this, uh, 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 program we've been able to invest uh, together with, of course, the private sector over $5.5 million in uh, over 700 uh, community projects that are designed and implemented by the communities uh, with uh, the guidance of the local government. And these have been into, you know, building schools, health facilities, water infrastructure, housing and roads. And also uh, most of them are, you know, agricultural uh, business based. And this has helped, you know, to provide alternative livelihoods to, to these communities that were, you know, our protectors and stewards uh, of uh, these national assets and uh, became, you know, uh, uh, lifetime um, uh, protectors. And therefore, uh, as long as this uh, uh, partnership is established, I do not see why, uh, as we all work towards recovering the, the national economies, why, the, the, you know, uh, we cannot uh, sustain this partnership going forward as well. So, so John and, and Justin, besides the more obvious, um, building the domestic tourism economy as a mainstay of sustainability and, and relying less on international visitors for the conservation estate, um, how do you see the model changing in, in African parks? Justin, I know you're engaged in Kenya, John in African parks in a number of countries. Do you think the, the social compact and the model will be adjusting? Justin? You, John? Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, in your introduction, you talked, um, Sean, there about how dependent conservation funding is on tourism. Um, tourism at its best can be quite fickle. COVID is something else altogether. So um, that leaves conservation in a kind of perilous standpoint. So absolutely right. We need to diversify the incomes for local communities. We need to diversify the incomes for conservation. That's not easy, not always easy. Um, but
But I think in addition to um, other industries and livelihoods, whether it's craft production, bee production, other forms of produce, um, bringing new technology to play, then I think we need to look at the worldwide opportunities from the worldwide business sector who are coming under increasing pressure to show their uh, carbon credentials uh, and their biodiversity credentials. And I think we'll see the invention, um, in fact, they've been around for decades, but I think they'll come to the fore, biodiversity credits, where businesses that are global businesses, multinational businesses that have done as much as they can demonstrably to reduce their impacts on biodiversity, but are still finding that they are having a negative impact, start funding through biodiversity credits work in conservation. So I think this is something over the next five years will become stronger and stronger and leave us in the point where conservation isn't 80% on, dependent on tourism, but it's perhaps 20% dependent on tourism, although I'm a great believer in growing tourism, but the rest of the four fifths are coming from a variety of different incomes. It would be more resilient, I think, both for the wildlife and more resilient for the communities. So do you see natural capital accounting and accounting for your biodiversity impacts mainstream in ESG reporting and investors actually coming to the part in enforcing that? Well, that's a, that's a, a million dollar question. In the UK, um, the Prime Minister commissioned a, a report from um, a Dasgupta report on the value of, of nature and ecosystem services and natural capital accounting is uh, part of the UK government strategy and underpins a lot of the work that is done. Um, I'm frustrated, honestly, Sean, about how slow that is progressing. It's been theoretical and for decades, and I think it urgently needs to happen. It's no longer acceptable for businesses to um, make use of natural capital, not pay for it, and pass the consequences of that off to wider society and government. That's not acceptable any longer. Uh, John, the number of staying on the same theme of, of the business model behind conservation and national parks, the balance of work between government, the private sector, charities, and some interests in the communities. How do you see that adapting in this post COVID world? Yeah, I think the starting point, uh, Sean, is that conservation has been chronically underfunded. That's the reality. And so, in the absence of funding, uh, there's been a search for where can you generate revenue that can be put back into conservation. And for example, look at Africa. It hasn't been right across the African continent, primarily Eastern and Southern Africa. They've uh, invested heavily in wildlife-based tourism. It's been very successful in generating revenue that has been able to be fed back into wildlife conservation, not always done as sustainably as it could be. And, and I have some sympathy for why there was such a, an emphasis on wildlife-based tourism, because as Justin said, it's not easy generating revenue for conservation through protected areas in a, if you like, a non-over-exploitative way. But the reality is um, we put too many eggs in that basket. It, it became too reliant upon tourism, and we're feeling the impact now from COVID-19. Now, the point was made earlier about COVID-19 and, and the implications for us and the interrelationship between wildlife-related pandemics, human health, and the economy, and we're all feeling that now. What we have to do is stop looking at wildlife conservation just as about wild plants and wild animals and wild places. It's about biodiversity. It's about climate change and combating climate change. It's about public health and ensuring we don't see viruses spill over from wild animals to people ever again. Um, it's about security. It's about livelihoods. It's about delivering on the sustainable development goals. So we have to attract investment from multiple other sectors here. We need public health to invest in protecting our last wild places so we avoid pandemics. We need to see um, corporate sector, as you just said, um, invest in biodiversity through biodiversity offsets. We're going to see much more effort placed on carbon credits and determining how much additional carbon you can claim for these places and put it on the market and, and attract resources that way. So we have to look at it as an investment proposition from a wholly different perspective. It's not just about wild places and wild animals. It's about all of these other issues that come into play. And I do agree what was said about COVID-19. I do think that has psychologically shifted people's thinking to recognize you can't keep messing around with nature. You can't keep messing around with wild animals, messing around with wild places and not have any consequences. And we're feeling the full brunt of that now with this pandemic, which is most likely related to wildlife, but we're also feeling it with the brunt of the impacts of climate change. 
what it means for being able to have healthy soils, grow food, what it means for local security. So let's take a much broader view of what these places are all about, attract investment from multiple different sources, and the return on investment will be no pandemics, combating climate change, biodiverse rich areas, better food, better security, better jobs. And the tourism sector has its role to play, yeah. but it's one player amongst many. And we need to solve this outside the silos and look at intersectoral cross-cutting approaches, which takes me to Aradna, because Aradna, we're talking a lot now about building back better after COVID, but you're involved in a project that's building it right from the outset, but wants to avoid the mistakes made in other destinations. And that's a Red Sea project in a very unique and pristine ecosystem in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So let me just ask you very bluntly, what are you doing different? Right. So if I could explain uh, what the project is doing differently in one word, the word I would choose is groundbreaking and doing so by being uncompromising, uncompromising in preserving the nature, culture. But quite frankly, nothing else will do because it is the custodian of perhaps the last remaining marine wonder in the world. You see, traditionally, if you have a coastal development and marine conservation, these two issues have been at loggerheads. So the Red Sea project is groundbreaking as an intervention because this project has successfully reconciled the two by embracing conservation as a primary goal at the outset. So I'm sure you've heard about the precautionary principle, which is something the Red Sea project has committed to applying. Now, the precautionary principle has been around since the 1990s, but it has rarely been formally adopted by the development sector. In a nutshell, the precautionary principle shifts the burden from the regulator needing to prove that a development will cause long-term environmental damage to the de developer saying, you need to prove that a development action will not cause long-term environmental damage. So in the Red Sea project, as an example, the development ratio is 10 is to one, which is unprecedented in any documented coastal tourism plan anywhere in the world. In other words, the project is not just going to minimize um, negative impact or even conserve or preserve, right? It's going to enhance the environment. It's going to increase biodiversity and deliver 30% net positive conservation. And even all activities outside of the conservation areas are 100% sustainable. So I'm talking energy, water. So finally, the project is striving to ensure all its efforts are aligned to the UN SDGs. So think about it. A good project which is using good materials, using good energy, good water, a project which is good for the people and most importantly, good for the economy. Now I want to go to John's point on the absence of funding. And I think this is critical because as good a project as this is, the challenge is as huge as the opportunity because the job is really only done when we can share the learnings with the world and make it scalable and inexpensive enough for everyone to emulate. So let's talk about funding. Um, there's massive capital flows now into recovery. Uh, stimulus measures, printing money all over the world to, to recover after COVID-19. And we're taking financial decisions that will shape the way we engage with nature, with society, with people for decades to come. So I guess it's a question, I know, John, you've looked at this before on, on where the subsidies go. Can governments do more to direct subsidies to intersectoral solutions rather than spending it in silos. And I think, Justin, you're also welcome to jump in on that. I know you're also passionate about looking at, at where the money flows. Thanks, Sean. Well, certainly, we have an opportunity here. I mean, this has been a devastating pandemic, but we do have an opportunity, as is often said, to build back better. So don't go back to doing what we were doing previously, but find a way of recalibrating now. We actually have very uh, environmentally destructive subsidies in place. We're actually doing the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. They're subsidizing industries and activities that are destructive to the environment. We need to wean ourselves off them and we need to start supporting a transition towards sustainability. So sustainability really needs to be at the core of anything we do in terms of a recovery package. And that's sustainability in the terms of addressing multiple crises all at the same time. The issue of the loss of biodiversity, the climate change crisis, the public health crisis and the implications of many other viruses that are out there that could spill over from wild animals to people if we don't better manage our relationship with wildlife. 
then we need to see a recovery in the economic sense of you know creating jobs but we can't break it down and put okay there's some money for biodiversity there's some money for climate there's some money for this there's some money for that da, da. you know that that's an old way of thinking in a very siloed approach we have to think of multiple benefits every dollar should return multiple benefits in terms of environment social and economic benefits so it gets back to this core issue of sustainability and i do think we know enough now you know we know what we're doing wrong we know what we can do to get it right and we can be pulled in the right direction by financing. If financing flows in the right way, it'll pull us all in the right direction. If we go back to the old way of doing things, we're going to find ourselves in this same situation 10 years' time and having an even more uh, depressing discussion about the impacts of biodiversity loss, climate and public health risk. Uh, but great examples, the Red Sea and what we see in volcanoes in uh, Rwanda and what Justin and Shannon are talking about, they're still not at global scale, but you know, we can see it's possible and they're good people with goodwill uh, who want to scale this up and, and carry it forward. So that gives one a sense of optimism. Justin, do you want to come in on this? Otherwise, I want to move on to the traveler. Just, um, just, just quickly, I agree with everything that John said. Um, I'm also reminded um, under COVID as under climate change of the inequality of all of this. Um, tourism industry is famously fragmented. Even the biggest players in the tourism industry are a tiny percentage of the whole. And I'm concerned that those with the best lobbying and the largest voices will get the majority of any support that's available. Um, most of the jobs in tourism are not in the big corporates. They're in the thousands and thousands and millions and millions of small tourism businesses. So I want to make sure that the Rwandan Community Tourism Project and others get um, uh, funding directed to them. So it's about John's point about how we think about funding, um, but also who is the recipient of it. And I'm concerned to make sure that SMEs, which are the bedrock of the global tourism industry get to recover and get to recover with incentives that it's sustainable, as John noted. Well, that's it's a perfect stage for me to go to you, Shannon, because you're looking at, at the operators on the ground, the product on the ground, mm -hmm. and how you can really <clears throat> make a difference by involving the traveler, because ultimately our end user is the traveler. And yeah. even if the science tells us it's urgent and we address the policy and the financing, unless we train travel behavior, we're not going to succeed. And one of your KPIs has to do with these authentic experiences. Yeah, um, I will say that I'm, I'm a little bit pleased you haven't yet asked the question to travelers. Uh, will, will we see their purchasing patterns change? Because I, I, I do tire of the traveler sentiment surveys versus actual traveler behavior survey. At the end of the day, we've just decided this is critical for us regardless um, um, of if it's important to the traveler, though we do hope it is. Uh, what you're referring to is our Make Travel Matter Experiences program. Um, and as almost everyone has pointed to already, the UN SDGs, of course, our new strategy is tied to the SDGs. Um, we feel they have done an, an awful lot of legwork. So it makes sense for us to leverage those goals, of course. There's, there's no argument there from us. And so um, in an effort to address the fact that, as Justin said, our, our industry is so disparate, um, and I don't see a change for that any day soon. We've created Make Travel Matter experiences to allow our product and operations teams to identify projects that have a genuine social and environmental good at their heart. You know, often you'll see in travel and tourism uh, marketing around a, a quote unquote sustainable experience and identified usually by a gut check. Oh, we feel good about this one. And that's not to discount any of those experiences at all. We just wanted to put a little bit of rigor around it so that we had consistency and that so our product and operations teams felt really good about the uh, experiences that they've identified. So what we did is we took the tactics that of course ladder up to the UN SDGs. From those tactics, we developed a set of criteria to then feed into an online assessment tool that our product and operations teams have access to and our criteria are available um, publicly and have been vetted uh, and um, endorsed by a number of organizations, UNWTO as well. Uh, and so that tool allows us to 
shift our whole product and operations focus to identifying these make travel matter experiences because they've been mandated that 50% of all experiences on all of our 40 brands um, have to include at least one make travel matter experience. So we're excited about it because it, even just the act of, of, of ensuring that our frontline teams, our sales teams are becoming fluent in the SDGs um, feels pretty good. And, and we're bringing it into an entire uh, communications plan internally so that it really does allow all of our team members to see what they can do to support the SDGs and why it's not just sort of up here academic speak, it's actually quite critical to all of us. So it's got a lot of impacts um, and it's, it's being really, really well, well received. Thank you. I want to uh, jump to right now. Yes, I see you, Anne. Would you mind? Terribly. Um, really itching to jump in. I just wanted to say, I think it's phenomenal what Shannon is doing at a corporate level. But I also wanted to say, I think we need to accept as individuals that we have a role to play. Because where you travel is how you vote with your wallet, of course, but also how you vote with your values. And as individual travelers, we need awareness that what we do, what we consume, how much we consume impacts the world and that we're all dependent on the health of the nature and culture and the history of the places we visit, right? I know it's very easy to say that and hard to do because at the end of the day, we are a society which is led by consumerism. But then again, maybe this is a call for each of us as individuals, as a society, and us as the travel, tourism, hospitality industry to change the way we measure success. So when Shannon is saying it's fantastic that the corporates are looking at it from that way, but maybe the destinations, uh, you know, you can't just keep measuring success by thinking of how many millions of visitors have you attracted. You can't keep talking about the billions of international receipts that you're going to generate. We need to value a destination based on how you treat your employees. How much value do you bring to your local community? So we need, we need changed matrix. Mm. That's exactly Before I jump to you, Ariella. Justin, I saw your aunt. Sorry, Janine, you go first. Right. No, I just think that that's a point Ariel, sorry, subtly made earlier, which is that um, corporates, regulators, travelers, we all need to uh, support the way in which, because we can all identify the change that we wish to make in whatever role that we have, but then we will always identify the, the ceiling. And in my case, often it's the destinations not providing the infrastructure that I might need for a a, a, a land-based energy program, you name it. And, and so I think that's what Ariel so, so said earlier was that as much as the word doesn't always mean anything. In this case, collaboration is really critical for us to make that yeah. that change, so, that massive change. So really, can I ask you as a destination, how do you manage capacity and, and the footprint um, of travelers? So, thanks, thanks, Sean. And thanks, Shannon, for um, uh, you know, bringing back the partnership um, aspects of things. And, and I think with COVID, we, we as destinations have learned uh, a lesson and I think it goes also, uh, I would say everyone within the, the, the value chain would say the same. Um, if, if we do not, uh, 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 you know, provide for a conducive environment and an and ecosystem that really works for, you know, our suppliers, for, for travelers, for everyone involved in this, in, the, in this whole industry to really work together and not confuse the traveler, is is uh, something that we we've learned as uh, as we we all reopen the destinations with very with various measures being put in place uh, for reopening and uh, coming back to Rwanda uh, how we measure how we we, we balance all that uh, Rwanda has put in place a, a strategy uh, that uh, ensures uh, low volume high value this is a, a national strategy that we've uh, been intentional about. And we've been, uh, you know, uh, sharing this vision with the private sector, and therefore we've seen uh, investors and and key partners really take interest in this uh, in this uh, strategy, and it is how we measure our our success, uh, how many livelihoods have been impacted positively by tourism, how uh, communities are actually, you know, there's things you cannot measure. There are things that are not tangible to, you know, that you can uh, really put value to it, but. Today, when you see that uh, it is not only the concern of the government and uh, and maybe some stakeholders, um, 
uh, in the protection and conservation uh, of these uh, uh, protected areas, when you see that the communities are actually taking the first uh, steps towards, you know, uh, proposing the changes, uh, uh, you know, uh, proposing how to use some of these natural resources, it really feels good. And uh, we can measure our success, our success like that. And, and I think it's really important what uh, uh, the previous uh, speaker talked about. Uh, it, it's high time that we do not only measure success through billions of dollars, but how you know, uh, livelihoods and, and, and mindset uh, have been shifted. So Justin, I'm gonna end with you. I can see you're eager to add on, on metrics. And I'm gonna link it to a question that's in the, in the chat function. Um, one of the viewers asking, um, on measurement also, are there any hotel companies focused on reducing inequities SG10? And how do we stop uh, models of tourism investment extracting value from local communities without putting back? So if I can link that to the question of metrics and throw that to you. Um, I just initially wanted to say that for all of us and for all of our customers, our impacts on biodiversity are greater when we're at home than when we're on holiday. We might take holidays occasionally. If we are uh, buying palm oil, soy, cocoa, leather, timber, pulp, paper, um, then we are contributing to the destruction of nature somewhere in the world. That's true whether we're on holiday, it's true when, when we're at home. It's no good sitting in your eco lodge looking at a lion if you're eating your third steak of the week because an orangutan is dying somewhere else in the world probably because of the conversion of forestry to farming. So at Responsible Travel, you know, we want people when they book our holidays to both have an extraordinary time, but in, be inspired when they come back to change their lives because that's where the greatest impacts are. Now to metrics, biodiversity metrics famously hard. What is our equivalent of a ton of carbon in biodiversity? We don't have it. Um, it's a problem for business. It's a problem for government. There is work being done furiously around the world towards the Convention in Biological Diversity CBD conference in China, perhaps next year, to set some metrics around biodiversity. So we're going to have to wait a little bit, but I think to really galvanize um, business and consumers, we need those goals and we need those targets. So I'm bringing it back specifically to biodiversity. We're not there yet. We're not where we need to be with targets in the same way we are for carbon and understanding both the material and non-material contributions of nature and biodiversity to our, to our tourism economy. We've got 15 minutes left. I would like to, to shift to one of the negatives on, on tourism's nature balance sheet. Uh, tourism is also a bulwark against poaching in conservation areas, in wildlife conservation, but unfortunately the Ill illegal trade in wildlife products is one of those issues that we need to address. And there seems to be quite a vacuum in international law. John, this is something that I know you're leading, uh, building a coalition. I know Shannon, the Travel Corporation, is, is one of the founder supporters of, of getting to a new protocol on illegal trade in wildlife products. So John, maybe you can introduce the topic for us. Thanks very much, Sean. And uh, thanks also to this sector, the World Travel and Tourism Council in particular has adopted a declaration, the Buenos Aires Declaration, that many uh, corporations have now signed up to to show how the tourism sector can assist in addressing this, uh, this challenge, which is not just about um, stopping the illegal trade in terms of what you're seeing, but also working with local communities, ensuring you're generating local wealth and local benefit because they'll be the best protectors of that wildlife when they've got a stake in it. So it's looking at it from a holistic perspective. But what we've seen, I think COVID-19 has really brought this to the fore is that um, we have serious gaps in our international regime for regulating wildlife trade. We only regulate wildlife trade to look at it from a conservation perspective. We don't look at the public health or the animal health implications of that trade. That needs to change. But also in terms of wildlife crime, I mean, we've learned a lot more about it uh, more recently. The World Bank put out a report in 2019, and they said, if you look at all uh, wild animals and plants uh, that are being illicitly uh, trafficked, that is not just those that are protected under international law through CITES, but all the timber and the fish species and other species that have no regulatory protection, they value that at over $200 billion a year. But they went beyond that and said that if you look at the impact that that uh, 
illicit trafficking and the illegal taking of uh, all of this wildlife has on ecosystems, you'd value it at one to $2 trillion a year because it has a massive impact on ecosystems, their ability to provide fresh water, sequester carbon, provide resilience, et cetera. But we don't have any uh, international agreement on how we can combat uh, these serious crimes. And given the consequences, if we look at the, the risk of spillover of disease from wild animals to people, and the, you can't calculate the cost of this pandemic, but there are many others just around the corner if we don't change what we're doing. If you look at the impact of climate change, biodiversity loss, we really need an international agreement where we can come together as an international community and say, we're going to deal with this seriously. And that includes showing mutual respect for one another's laws. We can't allow a situation where if somebody can steal something from one country, say it's Rwanda or Kenya or Peru or Australia or somewhere, if they can steal it from that country and get across the border, that they're home, home safe. They can take it to the destination country without a problem. No, we can't do that. In the destination country, you need to show respect for the source country's laws which means if you stole it from the source country, if it's a plant or an animal, and you get into the destination country and, and, and you can't prove that you took it legally, you will be prosecuted in the destination country for stealing that wildlife from that country and from those local people. So we really need to scale up our effort here because the, the, the scaled nature and consequences of these crimes are massive. It's depriving local communities of the benefit they can derive from using their own wildlife the way they want to not the way organized crime wants to exploit it. And it's taking revenue from governments. It's anything up to 12 billion a year. So we really need to scale this up. So we're proposing through this initiative that we need what's called a, a fourth protocol under the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. We have them on human trafficking, on uh, wild, uh, migrant smuggling and firearms, illicit trafficking and firearms. We need one on illicit trafficking in all wildlife, any wildlife. Um, and to show mutual recognition of one another's laws, respect the source country's laws. If they get out of the source country, you're going to get them at the destination end and they'll go behind bars for stealing that other country's wildlife. So if we fix the international legal regulatory vacuum and the airlines play their part, what more can we do creatively underground at industry level and, and traveler level? Aratna, Shannon, Justin, Ariella? So I think, um, um, Sean, I think we all have a violent agreement that we need to protect and preserve uh, the natural capital. But I guess what I want to say is all our efforts will be derailed if we do not enforce it. And when we are in a tough situation like this, probably what we need is creative solutions that are led by local communities. So one that I love is a theme, uh, which I think all of you would be very familiar with, but it also delivers on diversity and inclusion, where women, um, actually some badass local women take on the roles of uh, protectors. Um, in South Africa, in South Africa, you have the Black Mambas, which is an all female anti poaching unit that guard the wildlife. In the um, Philippines, um, in the central Philippines, actually, there are um, women um, um, who guard the marine ecosystem and they're on kayaks. Um, in Indonesia, uh, women do the same thing, but it's preserving their local culture and wisdom. Uh, it, it's a bit like Bobby's on the beach here in the UK. Um, they have a huge presence, they're uniformed, they saturate the landscape and are very visible and they always practice early detection. Most importantly, um, by thinking creatively like this, I think it strengthens women's local leadership in decision making and that's championing um, the SDGs at the end of the day. Shannon? Just uh, absolutely that's always been a, a struggle I would say in this space I, I, I come from a destination development background and working with 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 multiple small suppliers and and again I use the word disparate ad nauseum but that that tie between local decision makers and then what those of us coming into the destination um, wish to do or feel we ought to do is is tenuous at best, and I feel like that's a that's a that's a massive uh, loss in this whole system. Ariella, I think you also have an amazing story on on local grassroots buy in. Uh, actually, um, I think uh, we've also been part of uh, we've uh, as Rwanda be uh, integrated uh, platform also that uh, helps to share information. Uh, on uh, wildlife trade, illegal wildlife trade, so that we can we can be able to you know uh, 
prevent it uh, effectively across different nations. And it's uh, an initiative that we, that, you know, being driven by uh, uh, different uh, countries. But when we joined, we were uh, doing it through the COMIFAC, uh, which is, um, forgetting the full name, but it's a West African, you know, uh, uh, regional uh, uh, body that uh, oversees, you know, uh, uh, co uh, conservation of uh, forests uh, in West Africa. And this, we've seen uh, uh, an interest, uh, most importantly, uh, to collaborate with other countries, but also on uh, law enforcers and, and other people, stakeholders involved in this process uh, to be equipped with the right knowledge because the, the skills uh, is going to be very hard for, you know, the wildlife authority to be across all borders of the country. But if the law enforcers, the immigration, the uh, all these people uh, across this ecosystem are well trained, I think we, we can be able to uh, mitigate uh, illegal wildlife trade. Justin, did I see your hand as well initially? Yeah, I just wanted to say we're part of this. You know, the tourism industry and our, and our customers are part of this illegal trade. And a lot of it is well-meaning and in, inadvertent, if, if that makes sense. So, you know, isn't it nice, you know, on holiday, you pick up a shell from the, from the beach. It's just, well, you buy one, you buy a souvenir and you take it home. You don't actually know where it came from. Did it get washed up on the beach? Was it dredged up alive? Uh, you know, was it ripped from the seabed, you know, for trade? We don't know. So the tourism industry... We are part of, we and our customers are part of this illegal trade. And there's an enormous education job for us to do with our customers, which we, we haven't yet done. And I'm also, for the fierce women protecting wildlife, I'd, I'd love that. And um, they have my backing. Thank you. Let's, let's say we've got nine minutes left. Um, I think we've discussed uh, the threats to biodiversity from, from pollution to habitat loss, to land degradation, uh, to overexploitation. The one big elephant in the room we haven't discussed is climate change, human-induced climate change, the sort of second existential crisis along biodiversity, but, but also directly impacts biodiversity. And there's both a mitigation side to that, but also adapting to the unavoidable. And I, right now, I know you've been, you've been a champion of, of low-carbon travel and tourism for many years. So uh, I don't know if you've seen this. I'm sure you have. It's the best piece of uh, cartoon that I have seen recently. It's effectively an illustration which is um, representing the different crises that we're facing in, as a community um, as tsunami waves. So there is COVID, which is a small wave, and then there is a bigger climate change one. And finally, a biodiversity collapse, which is the biggest uh, wave um, over all of them, right? So once the COVID-19 wave comes to an end, the, uh, the climate change and biodiversity diversity collapse will inev inev inevitably follow. So in other words, we think we have a task at hand with the COVID crisis, but the fact is we have more than one curve to flatten. And climate change, biodiversity and COVID, it, it just cannot be handled separately because the minute COVID ends, climate change repercussions are going to be a lot harsher than what we have seen. And I think John alluded to it before when he said, we are going to, God forbid, see new kinds of viruses emerge out of these crises. So this exact interlink and relationship is the single most important reason why we have to support conservation and focus on environmental initiatives now, during the crisis. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that supporting conservation is going to fix COVID. Uh, and it's definitely not going to stop biodiversity loss altogether. But by supporting ecosystems that we still have, we and by conserving the biodiversity that still remains, we will be able to flatten parts of the climate change curve. We will be able to help flatten parts of the biodiversity collapse curve. It's what I call flipping the tragedy on its face and creating an opportunity out of it. John? Thanks, Sean. This goes uh, back to integrated approaches. Yeah, and uh, what Aradna said, I, I just totally agree. Um, and we have to stop looking at things in isolated packages and look at the interrelationship between them. There is a convergence here. The whole public health agenda, the conservational biodiversity agenda, the climate agenda, but also the broader SDG agenda, they are converging. We have to look at them together because if we try and pick them off and deal with them one by one, firstly, we'll fail. But secondly, we're not getting best return on the investment. As we've been saying today, if you can invest in wildlife conservation, you're dealing with biodiversity, you're preventing the next wildlife-related pandemic, 
you're combating climate change. And if you do it properly, the way Aurelio's talked about they're doing in Rwanda and doing in the Red Sea there, you're generating local benefits, local jobs, decent jobs for local people. You're delivering on the SDGs. So you've got a multiplicity of challenges that you're dealing with all at the same time. But we set up our institutions in a way and our conventions in a way that we like to break everything up because it's much easier to deal with it if you can do it in bite-sized pieces. That trend from the 70s and the 90s has to come to an end. The SDGs has tried to bring them together. We're not quite there yet. I think COVID is perhaps the what is tipping us across the edge to say, you know, there's a convergence here amongst issues. We have to look at it that way, create our response that way, invest that way, and then we'll get multiple benefits um, and we'll be in a much better position when we're sitting here in 10 years' time talking about how we turn the corner. So we've got four minutes left. I'm going to ask you in reverse order from the opening. What gives you hope? What green shoots and best practices out there give you hope and you think could be replicated or scaled to really make a, a disproportionate impact? Let's start with you, Justin. Okay, I'm going to go right outside the tourism industry. I, I am an advisor to the UK government on sustainable business. I want to give a couple of examples. In planning law, um, housing development in the future will need to deliver in the UK, a 10% gain in biodiversity. There's a formula for how that's calculated and it will be transparent. I would like to see that in tourism. Tourism businesses required to deliver a biodiversity net gain. Secondly, under new UK law announced today, it will be illegal to use certain commodities if they destroy biodiversity, especially deforestation. Uh, businesses will need to know where everything in their supply chain comes from, otherwise they will be fined. And I would like to know which tourism businesses in the future will be able to main, in the mainstream will be able to comply with that. So some good examples there, tough examples coming from outside the tourism industry. Concrete and measurable, Shannon. Um, I was I was I was really considering what Justin was saying there. Um, what gives me hope is that again back to that word collaboration, which I really I, I don't like. Um, because it often is meaningless. I think we're seeing a shift and I think it's taking on new meaning. Um, you know, at the Travel Corporation, we're sharing best practice and resources on our, you know, how we measure climate, uh, carbon footprint of every one of our trips with other operators. And I would say we're coming together finally to identify that sustainability is not a selling proposition, but it's a shared challenge. And that to me gives hope because as Justin said earlier, uh, you know, and certainly in, in my country, in, in Canada, the last report, this industry was made up of about 87% of SMEs. So it's, it's, it's wonderful to talk about high level cross issue responses, but what does that mum and pup do? They're, they need to start somewhere. And so I'm starting to see tools being designed for the SME and the sharing of best, best practices that they want and need, but don't have the resources to do in the way that, that some of us might. So that to me is, is positive. John? Thanks. I think what I feel positive about is what I've heard today by Aurelia, by Shannon, by Aradna, by Justin. You know, things are happening and they're not just things that are at a global scale with the, you know, post-2020 biodiversity framework. It's right down to the ground. Aurelia talks about, you know, what the local benefits are to people and how you've got government, private sector, local communities converging around a beautiful wildlife asset that is going to be there in perpetuity because the model is right. So what gives me hope? I, I do think this COVID-19 pandemic, perhaps even more than climate change, has tipped us over the edge in terms of our understanding of our interrelationship with nature and that it can't just be all one-way traffic, that we're continuing to exploit nature and thinking there's no consequence. We are, and I've heard many speakers talk today about this idea of nature positive. We have to see, and if we look at this industry, it has to be nature positive, local decent jobs positive, local opportunity positive. It has to put more in than it takes out. And I do think just hearing today, but also more generally conversations I'm having with multilateral agencies, with conventions, private sector, I do think we're seeing a shift in thinking. We do need to see though the financing go in the direction of where we need to land because that will be what pulls us together and sees all these issues converge in the way they have to. Good, I see the clock is now ticking. Ariella, if I can ask you in 30 <laughs> seconds, sorry to cut back on your time. 
Uh, no worries. I think uh, this, this discussion alone was uh, quite insightful, uh, you know, putting together biodiversity and tourism in one uh, place uh, and ha share these experiences across the board. But most importantly, what uh, we need to keep in mind is uh, as we work towards the future, is to keep, um, you know, uh, policies, uh, opportunities for private sector, communities, livelihoods, all interlinked for uh, a cross-cutting issue, which is biodiversity conservation. Thank you. All right now. So I'm going to be controversial and say, what we have now is the equivalent of a Me Too or a BLM movement in conservation. Why do I say this? Last month when Sir David Attenborough joined Instagram, he caused quite the sensation and raked up more followers than celebrities in a matter of hours. It was a world record. And to me, that is telling. And I can't say it probably better than the words that he used, which is saying, we know what to do. We just need the will. Saving our planet is now a communication challenge. That is why all of us being here and discussing and debating this is especially relevant. Thank you very much uh, for sticking to the time, but more than that, for your insights, for your, for your sharing your wisdom, wisdom today. This is not the last conversation. It's a relatively recent conversation in some parts of the tourism industry. We were all delighted in the last year with the IPBES were nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize because that really showed that this existential crisis has a sense of urgency that makes it at least as pressing as global health pandemics and climate change. So this conversation will continue. I think the second take home for me is biodiversity needs tourism and tourism needs biodiversity and neither can survive without the buy-in of communities. And then finally, and it is a resounding message from all five of our panelists, that true stewardship is not about mitigating impacts or even about neutral impacts. It's about having a positive impact, a positive impact on, on people, on the planet, and on our business models. So thank you very much for your time today and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.